Good morning from Toronto. Uh, welcome from everybody from the rest of the world. Uh, delighted to welcome you to Frontiers in Immunology and IUIS's Global Talks on COVID-19. I'm delighted to uh, welcome this morning um, Eleanor Fish. Uh, my name is Juan Carlos Zuniga Fluker. I am the uh, professor and chair of the Department of Immunology at the University of Toronto. I'm also a senior scientist at Sunnybrook Research Institute in Toronto. And this morning, we're delighted to have Professor Eleanor Fish, who is a scientist emerita at the Toronto General Research Institute, part of a university health network, and is a professor and associate chair of international collaborations and initiatives in the Department of Immunology at the University of Toronto. Now to let, tell you a little bit about Eleanor, uh, Eleanor received her bachelor's degree from the University of Manchester studying biological chemistry, went on to receive a master's in philosophy in virology from King's College University, uh, University of London and the United Kingdom, and went on to uh, pursue her PhD studies on cell biology at the Institute of Medical Sciences in the University of Toronto. Eleanor uh, has been studying interferon and viral responses for most of her career. She's led and pioneered remarkable work on the structure function and signaling aspects and cell responses to interferons and, and also in studying the molecular interactions thereof. She's been in the forefront of interferon research for, for all her career and uh, related to the uh, topic of today's talk, uh, uh, a few years back, she headed a study on the use of type 1 interference during the initial SARS-1 epidemic. Um, Eleanor is also a fellow of the, Amer of the African Academy of Sciences and a consultant on severe uh, respiratory um, stress syndromes uh, and emerging infections uh, for the WHO. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Eleanor, who will tell us uh, about her work on type 1 interference uh, on COVID-19. Eleanor? Thank you, uh, Jason. Take it away. Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> as you can see from this first slide, I'm going to talk to you about global outbreaks, and I hope by the end of this presentation, um, I will convince you, will have convinced you that um, perhaps we should consider interferons as first responders regardless of the virus outbreak. Um, so in this uh, map of the globe, you can see that uh, there are a number of viruses that I've identified. And this is really just to um, remind us all that global infections are, are not rare. Global virus infections are not rare. And indeed, um, there are those like the HIV uh, pandemic, which persists. There are now some 40 million people around the globe infected with HIV. Um, certainly, there are a number of virus outbreaks that are annual and for which we have uh, no vaccine and no antiviral. So, for example, Lassa fever virus, many of you are unaware of, that pops up annually in uh, Africa, about 500,000 cases per year no vaccine, no antiviral. We know with the Ebola virus outbreak at the time in 2014, um, there was no vaccine and no antiviral, and uh, a vast number of people in Western Africa became infected. This has persisted in the Democratic Republic of Congo. There's still an outbreak there. Um, and again, we still are not really uh, able to treat individuals. Um, SARS coronavirus outbreak initially in 2003. Um, uh, again, at that time, no vaccine, no antivirals, and we're still in that situation right now with the MERS, uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, um, also a coronavirus. Again, an outbreak, uh, outbreaks with no vaccine and no antivirals. So the emerging theme is that every time there is a newly emerging or re-emerging virus, um, we're playing catch up in the context of looking for uh, developing a new vaccine and at the same time looking for potential therapeutic interventions. Our first line of defense against any and all virus infections is our innate immune response. And those first 24 hours, those first 
uh, day is a very critical and determine uh, the outcome of this infection. And what I hope to convince you is this, the, this is very much dependent on that type one interferon response. So this, this is for many of you a very familiar um, scheme. We know that viruses um, are recognized um, by their um, associated molecular patterns or their DNA um, by a variety of different pattern recognition receptors on or within different cells. And as you'll appreciate, viruses are able to infect many different uh, types of cells. So it's important that uh, pretty much every cell in our body has some sort of recognition receptor that will allow um, an immune response to be triggered. And whether these are toll-like receptors on the surface of cells or in endosomal compartments, whether these are nod-like receptors. Um, so as I mentioned, there are a number of pattern recognition receptors um, on all our cell types that allow for the recognition of these viruses. And really what I want to draw your attention to, um, and I don't know if you can see my pointer now in the bottom right-hand corner, but the end point of activation of all these receptors, wherever they are and on whatever cells they are, the end point is the activation, transcriptional activation of um, type 1 interferons, interferons alpha and interferon beta. So regardless of the virus and regardless of the tropism of that virus for a particular cell, interferons are always turned on. And why is that? That's because interferons uh, are very pleiotropic in terms of their biological responses. And you can see from this slide, um, as interferons bind to their cell surface receptor, which by virtue of the fact uh, these receptors are ubiquitous and have to be on pretty much every cell type because every cell can be targeted by different viruses. What happens is receptor activation leads to this incredible network of signaling cascades that results in histone modification, um, the activation, transcriptional activation of a number of genes, and I've highlighted on the right-hand side those that we absolutely are aware of that are involved in invoking an antiviral response. Interferons also are able to activate mRNA translation, so there is efficient protein production. So it is because of this very complex network of signaling that interferons are pleiotropic in the context of their antiviral response. So what I show you here is a scheme that also highlights how in addition to being direct antivirals, that is, they will activate uh, a number of genes that are involved in inhibiting virus replication at various stages of the virus -like life cycle. So for example, interferons will activate genes that are involved in a product that will limit the entry of viruses into cells, that might limit the uncoating of an enveloped virus, that would interfere with uh, RNA or DNA replication very specifically by degrading the genomic material of the virus, that would influence um, or inhibit the assembly of proteins that form the viral the virus, and likewise, as I mentioned, will, uh, as well as inhibiting entry, will inhibit egress. So interferons have direct antiviral effects, and depending on the virus, so those stages of that replicative cycle, cycle will be interfered with. But at the same time, interferons are very effective at invoking uh, an immune response. Specifically, they will allow for the proliferation of hematopoietic stem cells, um, such that there are uh, an abundance of, for example, monocytes or dendritic cells. At the same time, interferons will activate those cells, uh, polarize them, for example, T helper cells towards a T helper 1. They will activate cytotoxic CD8 T cells to become more toxic. They will influence a number of cells to secrete um, chemokines to orchestrate the trafficking of immune cells to a site of insult and infection. They will activate macrophages to become more efficient. Um, they will uh, activate B cells and promote their polarizations towards becoming antibody producing producing cells. So 
the salient point here is that interferons uh, are pleiotropic in the context of being direct antivirals for any specific virus, and also in the context of their activating immune responses. So having set the stage, um, let me now talk about some of the work that I've involved in uh, in the context of coronaviruses. So as we know, in 2003, there was uh, an epidemic, uh, an outbreak of SARS coronavirus uh, in uh, China, and um, this particular outbreak was spread to a restricted number of uh, countries around the globe um, and based on the uh, travel of an index case um, to, to, for example, Canada, and it then spread from Vancouver across the uh, country to Toronto. So this particular outbreak of SARS coronavirus uh, infected uh, about 8,000 um, individuals, and there were 774 deaths. Um, and by in Canada, we had uh, 251 cases and 43 deaths. And to reiterate, at the time of this outbreak, there was no vaccine and there were no antivirals. Um, and coronaviruses tend to be mild infections, but this was not the case with this particular one. Notably, um, as I've mentioned, interferons are able to uh, inhibit the replication of uh, all viruses, and viruses have co-evolved to encode in their genomes factors which very specifically block inter an interferon response. Um, and the particular SARS coronavirus encodes in its genome four factors, non-structural protein one, non-structural protein three, open reading frame six, and the M protein, which all are uh, able to block um, an interferon response. So this informs us that interferons are important for clearance of this virus. So at that time, um, we were able to mobilize and look at the ability of an interferon alpha. This is a novel synthetic interferon, interferon alpha con one, to very specifically inhibit the replication of this particular virus uh, in cell cultures in vitro. And at the same time, we used ribavirin, which was the standard of care uh, around the globe for this infection at the time. Again, it's a respiratory infection, infects both the upper and lower respiratory tracts. And what I show you here is that if you look at the bottom of this slide, with increasing gross doses of either ribavirin up to uh, 2,000 micrograms per mil, or interferon up to 5,000 international units per mil, you can see that ribavirin is totally ineffective at inhibiting this virus, whereas interferon um, alpha-con-1 is able to uh, inhibit virus replication completely. And based on this and some other studies that we did, we mobilized to uh, <clears throat> undertake a clinical study in Toronto in patients in hospital that were infected with this coronavirus. So what I show you in the upper panel here is a series of four chest x-rays where you can see from day nine from onset of symptoms through to day 18, the lungs become uh, white, become occluded. Um, there's this opacity which uh, indicates that the lungs are become consolidated and there's obviously a restriction in the amount of oxygenation there. In the two lower series, I show you um, chest x-rays from patients that received a subcutaneous injection of interferon alpha-con-1 daily, and you can see that the lungs progressively um, become clear. So we, uh, we showed that in this particular uh, study, interferon was able to um, clear the lungs. And in fact, what we were able to demonstrate that from the, uh, we were able to look at the time to 50% resolution of uh, chest X-ray abnormalities. And the yellow plot shows you the time uh, with interferon treatment and the red plot uh, of the control patients. And I think what you'll appreciate is that the interferon group had a much more rapid resolution of their lung pathology. Quality. On average, it took four days versus 11 and a half days for the control group. And indeed, when we looked at a number of other measures of um, uh, clinical parameters for this disease, we could see, as you can see on the right-hand panel, that for those patients that received interferon, their oxygen saturation, which is obviously a reflection of their lung uh, capacity, 
um, their oxygen saturation in their blood remained high and those patients did not require any oxygen supplementation, whereas the open circles, the control group, um, many of them went on to receive nasal prongs, oxygen supplement, supplementation, and some went actually uh, into the ICU for intubation. If we look at a number of other parameters here, I really just want you to focus on uh, the two right-hand ones in the lower section, that's uh, lactate dehydrogenase and uh, creatine kinase. These were measures of... Um, uh, lung pathology uh, in this particular uh, infection. And uh, you can see certainly that uh, for the creatine kinase, um, which spiked in severe cases that demonstrated acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, those who received interferon, the closed circles, that plot, uh, never had a spike in creatine kinase. And indeed, in the context of lactate dehydrogenase, we saw they had lower levels and resolved sooner. So I also want to point out, because this is very often a concern with interferon treatment, um, that there was no evidence of a cytokine storm or any adverse events in these patients that were treated with interferon. When we looked at these patients, so we took peripheral blood and we examined the peripheral blood for um, gene expression following interferon treatment, uh, patient one did not receive interferon and patients two and three, these are examples that I show you here. What we can see is that their gene expression profiles, uh, this is a heat map, um, were influenced by interferon treatment, and a number of the genes that are listed on the right-hand side uh, are associated with um, a response to an infection and, indeed, are interferon-inducible genes. So let's now switch in the last few moments um, to uh, our studies that we've proceeded with in the context of COVID-19. So to date, as of this morning, um, there were reported 3 million, over 3 million cases of COVID-19 around the globe, and to date, approximately uh, 207,860 deaths. What we do know is that this virus, um, in the same way as uh, SARS coronavirus, uh, infects type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes and alveolar macrophages. And in contrast to the SARS coronavirus, where the fatality rate was estimated to be about 10%. To date, the, with um, all the caveats associated with um, the number of confirmed cases, um, as opposed to the actual number of cases, we believe the fatality rate ranges anywhere from 2 to 7%. So it's a less fatal disease. This is um, uh, some data that I'm showing from a uh, publication that's just uh, just been uh, published, um, comparing SARS coronavirus with SARS coronavirus 2. And really what I want to point out to you in the upper panel here, the area under the curve analysis, is that when um, human lung explants were infected with a million PFUs of either SARS coronavirus or SARS coronavirus 2, what um, these... Uh, authors were able to demonstrate that SARS coronavirus 2 um, is actually far more infectious. It's about uh, threefold more infectious within the first 48 hours than SARS coronavirus. Um, so the multiplicity of infection is much higher. And if you look in the lower three panels, um, this uh, shows you that when um, these lung cells are infected with um, either uh, uh, coronavirus or coronavirus 2 or mock infected uh, and looked for gene expression, examined for gene expression, what we can see is for the uh, SARS coronavirus, the blue um, plots, uh, there is a modest induction of uh, interferon alpha and interferon beta, but notably for SARS coronavirus 2, there is an absence of induction of interferon alpha or interferon beta. What I show you here, thanks to a colleague of mine, Elise Neugen at the uh, University Health Network, is similar to SARS coronavirus. Um, this is a, a chest X-ray of a 68-year-old woman with fever, worsening shortness of breath. Um, and this is three days after um, a PCR swab for uh, the virus. And <clears throat> what you can see, um, the chest X-ray findings, is that the peripheral airspace 
um, is consolidated in both the upper and the lower lobes as shown by the yellow arrows. Um, so not too dissimilar from SARS coronavirus, the x-rays I showed you earlier. So based on um, our results with SARS coronavirus during the 2003 outbreak, we undertook at the beginning of the outbreak in Wuhan, China, an exploratory study in one of the hospitals, Union Hospitals. Um, and I want to emphasize that this is an exploratory study. And what we did, we examined 77 confirmed cases of COVID-19 between the time period January 11th to February the 12th. And we undertook um, a study to examine or evaluate the effectiveness of interferon treatment in these individuals. So for this particular study, we used a nebulized interferon alpha 2b. In other words, um, we took uh, interferon alpha 2 as a solution. We made an aerosol and by virtue of a mask, we're able to deliver it to patients twice daily, 5 million units. Um, the treatment that the patients received was at the discretion of the attending physician. So seven patients received this nebulized interferon alpha 2b. Ardol, which is a broad spectrum antiviral, um, was standard of care across um, Wuhan at that particular time. Patients received um, tablets, 200 milligrams, three times a day. And um, we had uh, 20, 24 patients uh, received uh, Arbidol. And in addition, there were 46 patients that received both Arbidol, tablets three times daily, and the nebulized interferon twice daily. For each of these patients, we took throat swabs to examine by PCR the level, the uh, presence or absence of virus. We took CT scans. We monitored their temperature, their blood oxygen saturation, and throughout their stay in hospital, um, they were uh, examined. Uh, their blood biochemistry was evaluated, cell counts, and cytokines. So I should point out that no patient had exhibited signs or symptoms of end organ dysfunction and no patient developed any respiratory distress that required prolonged oxygen supplementation or intubation. So these we consider were moderate cases of COVID-19. What this slide shows you is for the three treatment groups, the blue Arbidol plot, the Arbidol plus interferon plot in red, and the interferon alone plot, Essentially, there were no differences in their body temperatures or their, in their oxygen saturations. Um, essentially, none of the, we, we could not see that um, there were spikes or significant spikes in fever in any of the treatment groups, and their oxygen sats all fell within the range that I mentioned that did not require prolonged supplementation. If we looked at uh, a number of other parameters, and for ease of viewing here, um, and based on the heterogeneity of the um, interferon plus Arbidol group, um, their regimens uh, were quite heterogeneous in terms of starting interferon treatment relative to Arbidol. We've combined the interferon and the interferon plus Arbidol groups together. Uh, interferon either alone or with Arbidol as the red plot, and Arbidol alone is the blue plot. You can see for pretty much all of these um, parameters that were evaluated, uh, there really was no difference among the treatment groups. And indeed, they all fell within normal range. Um, uh, the values on the y-axis show the range, and uh, you can see that, as I said, they all fell within uh, the normal range, and there were no differences among the treatment groups. Similarly, there were no differences among the treatment groups in blood cytokines and procalcitonin, which is a measure of sepsis, um, when measured uh, throughout the, the time these patients were in hospital. Um, here, I've, for clarity, because of the concerns about cytokine storms, I've left the interferon alone treated group in, so we have both interferon treated groups. But again, uh, no differences amongst the treatment groups. Likewise, if we look at uh, peripheral blood cell populations among the treatment groups, uh, and again, the y-axis uh, tells the range of values, um, we can see that essentially, uh, bearing in mind the normal levels, there are very little fluctuations amongst any of the treatment groups. Um, perhaps uh, the, one can see that in the um, 
third row down, far to the right, the platelet counts, uh, we can see that there is an elevation, uh, a transient elevation in platelets uh, early on in infection, but again, no difference amongst the three treatment groups. However, when we looked at a viral clearance um, as uh, measured from day from on onset of symptoms to viral clearance, you can see in this panel that uh, there seems to be a difference between interferon treated patients and arbitral only treated patients, specifically that their viral clearance is more rapid. And when we consolidate in the two groups that received interferon, on into a single group, we can see that uh, there is indeed a significant acceleration of viral clearance from the upper respiratory tract in the interferon-treated patients. On average, the uh, median or the mean to uh, clearance was seven days faster for those patients who received interferon treatment. Um, I should point out that when we looked at comorbidities, when we looked at age, and we considered sex, male or female, the effects of interferon treatment remained significant. Next, uh, in this slide, I show you the effects of interferon treatment on two biomarkers of inflammation, uh, IL-6, circulating IL-6, and C-reactive protein. And um, what pub a number of publications are, are revealing and data is emerging um, clinical studies that IL-6 seems to be a really important biomarker for um, ARDS or the inflammatory, severe inflammatory response in the lungs of COVID-19 cases. And what I show you here is that interferon treatment dramatically and significantly reduced the, the levels of circulating IL-6 and C-reactive protein in these patients. Once again, comorbidities, age and sex um, when considered uh, either as continual variables, um, the age or as uh, or not, um, we could see that interferon treatments uh, remain significant. What you here is a, a panel of four representative um, CT scans from the various patients uh, in this study. And really, um, regard treatment, um, what we see is that, for example, if you look at um, the upper right hand panel, panel so this is a female 30 years of age, um, her PDR was negative on day nine, but you can see even out to day 14, her CT scan shows considerable uh, uh, ground glass op opacities and um, her score was 10, uh, the CT score scan score. So the CT scan score is based on um, upper and lower uh, lobes. Each, each of the four lobes has uh, can be scored up to a severity of five, so the maximum score for a CT scan would be 20. Um, if you look at the other panels, for example, the uh, lower right-hand panel, this was a female 51 years of age who received interferon plus arbidol. Uh, she was PCR negative on day 12, um, and you can still see there's some residual, albeit low, um, glass, uh, ground glass opacity. Um, and uh, on the upper right-hand panel, this is a male, 32 years, who received interferon plus arbidol, um, took out to day 38 to become PCR negative. In fact, this particular individual fluctuated from positive to negative to positive to negative, but then, received, to then was a confirmed negative two consecutive days, um, 24 hours apart. Um, and this is a uh, significant um, score, 18. Remember, the maximum is 20. So what I hope I've showed you is that, um, albeit the limitations that this was a small cohort, non-randomized, and the treatment arms were of an unequal size, um, the data seem to suggest that interferon treatment accelerated viral clearance, interferon treatment reduced IL-6 and CRP levels, and um, we are able to show that age, comorbidities, and sex did not negate the interferon effects. And these findings are the basis for, for um, a number of randomized controlled trials that are currently under consideration. 
and uh, should be starting fairly soon. So what I hope I've uh, been able to convince you that interferons do have uh, application in acute virus infections and perhaps should be considered, the more so because this particular one seems to have a very high uh, infectivity early on uh, in contrast to uh, SARS coronavirus, where maximum levels of virus infectivity were days 7 to 10 post-onset of symptoms. Um, so early treatment with an antiviral is definitely recommended, and perhaps later on um, one needs to consider um, these anti-IL-6 uh, or anti-inflammatories. And I wish to acknowledge my colleagues who've helped me with these studies. Um, both with the SARS coronavirus and more recently my colleagues are with this COVID-19. And with that, um, I will turn to uh, JC and any questions that there might be. Yes. Eleanor, uh, yes, one of I'm them uh, asked you... about um, um, the time of delivery and, and whether the, what was the criteria of patients to receive interferon treatment for the inclusion in the, in the study? Okay, so this, so I can answer the second question first. The, uh, this was an uncontrolled study. What happened was that my colleagues in China um, were aware of our JAMA publication about SARS coronavirus, and the government of China, uh, round about uh, in January, recommended interferon treatment based on that publication and discussions with um, the CDC in China. So. Uh, at that time, patients were being given Arbidol, and then the edict came down to consider uh, interferon. So at the discretion, this was an uncontrolled, non-randomized trial, um, the doctors at, in Union Hospital uh, came on board to start treating with interferon. Um, so there was no specific uh, uh, you know, randomization that went on here. In terms of dosing, um, it was uh, the dosing was the same for every patient who received interferon. It was five million units twice daily, uh, nebulized by this inhalant mask. Um, there was one question the about question? the use of. Uh, I just re relate to that uh, use of uh, aerosolized uh, interferon. Was there any effect on the uh, stability of uh, interferon to the by being? So the reality is that you know this was done during this init initial uh, outbreak. Uh, close scrutiny of the mask, what we've subsequently learned is that actually a lot of the inferior, interferon was actually ingested and didn't go down the uh, into the respiratory tract. So we've actually developed now and, and are in the process of uh, putting on board a new, new kind of inhaler delivery system that actually can be done at home, where we'll get 100% delivery deep down into the lungs. There was a few questions regarding that as well, and whether it was uh, immunogenic or, or whether it could lead to uh, increase in severity in, 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 in some cases, the, uh, the provision well, of interference. Well, again, all I can, at this point, all I can comment on this time is the uh, various uh, parameters that we measured. Uh, we did not see a cytokine storm in our patients. You know, we looked at a whole range of cytokines and inflammatory markers. And if anything, as I showed you with that IL-6 plot, those patients who received interferon had reduced levels of IL-6. So um, we don't, we didn't see um, any exacerbation in fever, which would be indicative of um, an inflammatory response and a cytokine storm. We didn't see circulating levels of uh, TNF or IL-6 associated with interferon treatment. So bearing in mind that uh, this is, as I said, a, an exploratory study, um, I do not believe that interferon in any way exacerbated um, the disease. Right. A related question was whether viral clearance were correlated to the levels of 6 or CRP in the treatment. Yeah, so, so, so what, all, all we could do was essentially look at uh, the time course for viral clearance and the time course for IL-6 and CRP circulating levels. And what we saw that um, viral clearance occurred fairly rapidly early on and uh, subsequently you didn't get that spike in IL-6. Um, so 
we believe that there's a functional link uh, between reductions in viral load and <coughs> the onset of inflammation in the lungs. But again, this needs to be explored in further detail in, a, in, a, in, a, in our RCT, which is what we're doing. Right. And, and again, uh, this seems to be the case with SARS coronavirus 1. We, you know, you, you saw that early viral clearance eliminated the subsequent inflammatory response in the lungs. And a related question to the study as well, uh, for a broader use, how costly would the treatment be uh, to a, given to a large number of individuals? Well, uh, that's a good question. So one of the points is that interferon is now, um, the patents have expired. So there's a, a large, not a large, there are companies that are making generic um, uh, biosimilars, uh, which are much cheaper. What we're anticipating, we're actually doing a post-exposure um, study, uh, we hope to study uh, to start soon, that actually may be prophylactically um, short duration treatment, perhaps with an inhaled interferon or a sub-Q, we're waiting to see, um, would actually be the, the appropriate approach so people wouldn't actually go to hospital at all. Those with mild symptoms would reduce the duration of their um, virus infection. So to answer your question, this should be uh, not an expensive alternative, um, but I think one has to, governments have to consider, you know, who to treat and when to treat. Um, so that, that also, isn't going to be my decision. That, that also answers another question about uh, other routes of administration as well, since you pointed out there are other uh, modalities at which you can provide this. Um, um, so one, one of the things we're broad. thinking about is, if I can just jump in here, JC, and say, so another strategy would be to use a subcutaneous injection of pegylated <coughs> interferon um, that you have longer duration, you know, good levels in the blood for up to five days, and maybe that's the approach to do just three sub-Q injections of somebody early on in their disease every five days. Perfect. Uh, uh, more general questions or related questions as well. Did you uh, appreciate any, uh, this is, I guess it's likely you didn't look at this, but they're asking about whether interferon treatment affects levels of, of the recovery receptor of ACE2 in on epithelial cells or other immune cells? Didn't, uh, weren't able to, to examine that. Um, uh, again, more general questions regarding uh, the role of interference. Uh, Contributions of any other interference and interferon lambda, and whether these vary or affect uh, the response to this treatment or broadly? So, I mean, there's, there's considerable interest on using interferon lambda uh, for COVID-19. Um, problem is it's not as widely available uh, and, and clinically approved as both the interferon alphas and interferon beta. So the availability uh, may prove to be an issue at this stage. Uh, but certainly, I think it's worth considering interferon lambda, and certainly um, interferon lambda has, demonstrates good antiviral efficacy. Which might be the more potent remains to be examined. All right. Any any um, uh, role of glutathione in boosting interferon responses? Um, just a general question. No. Don't know. It's fine. Uh, another general question. Another general question was the uh, potential role or interactions between chloroquine and and rem, remdesivir uh, and in, interferon. Okay, so I think the general consensus right now is that chloroquine and hydrochloroquine probably should not be considered as effective treatments. I think the emerging data seems to suggest that, if anything, there may be some adverse events associated with uh, those treatments, certainly in, in combination with the, uh, azithromycin. Um, remdesivir, we're still awaiting the uh, randomized controlled trials. There's been some use of remdesivir with um, uh, uncompassionate use, but again, we're awaiting the results. You know, interferon is an antiviral and it's an immune modulator. Remdesivir is very specifically an antiviral. Should we be considering combination treatments? Absolutely. I mean, we've seen with HIV that <laughs> combination treatments are the way to go. The, the actual question I would be asking is, should we be considering an antiviral early on uh, 
and then um, something like uh, anti-IL-6 uh, later on. Um, I think that might be the uh, appropriate treatment regimen. Uh, another related, a uh, broad question, uh, role of plasma therapy and uh, with interference, does it induce it? Does it, um, what's again, the relation? You know, with, with, so plasma therapy, again, we still don't know the answer. You know, is plasma, you know, is an antibody therapy going to be effective against this virus? You know, and what levels of antibody? I mean, this is also going to relate with the vaccine strategy. Uh, we just don't know. Um, is there any evidence that plasma therapy induces interferon? No, we haven't. Those studies haven't been done. Um, I mean, right now the work is focusing on looking at plasma therapy in the context of um, whether there are neutralizing antibodies that would be effective against uh, this virus infection. Right. Uh, going back to questions directly related to, the, to your studies, uh, any any um, side effects seen from from the treatments? So uh, my clinical colleagues in Wuhan informed me that there were no uh, negative effects associated, no clinical negative effects that they could see, no worsening of syndromes, no um, spiking in fever, um, none of the cytokine storms that people are concerned about. Remember, this is a, a treatment of an acute virus infection, not a chronic virus infection. So we couldn't necessarily expect to see those uh, uh, adverse events uh, during this acute treatment phase. Um, and certainly when we started, when we measured what we could from those patients in terms of circulating levels of cytokines and inflammatory markers, we and looked at body temperature, we didn't see that interferon, there was any difference amongst any of the treatment groups and the patients um, did not worsen on these therapies. I there's a few more questions regarding the timing of when it would be best to deliver interference, including whether it can be used um, uh, ahead of uh, uh, infection. Um, so can you, so, uh, from your you study? Know, that, uh, yeah, from this study, uh, you know, earlier the patients were treated post onset of symptoms, and this is those patients that um, exhibited symptoms, okay? And we've already learned that there are a number of uh, individuals who are infected with this virus who are asymptomatic um, and then become PCR positive. So uh, from onset of symptom, the sooner we started the interferon therapy, the sooner they arrived in the hospital uh, with confirmed PCR positive, um, the, the, the better it was in terms of, you know, if you accelerate viral clearance, if you do this sooner rather than later. As I've indicated, the difference between this particular coronavirus 2 and SARS coronavirus of 2003, it has a much higher uh, infectious rate. The, 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 uh, it's about threefold more, the multiplicity of infection. So you really want to treat early, as early as possible. Um, so as soon as you get a confirmed PCR positive, regardless of the antiviral therapy, you need to be treating early. Prophylactically, um, that's the study that we're about to embark upon to see whether in contacts of index cases, we can demonstrate that prophylactic treatment with interferon will either prevent them becoming um, infected or reduce their viral burden or allow for a faster resolution of infection. Let's wait and see. Um, we're using, you know, that, that, those data will become available, um, hopefully, in the next, in the coming months. And a related question, uh, also a broader question, is the, um, the type of response for an individual in terms of their own interferon response um, relate to the severity or the duration of the disease? Don't know. Again, that's a really good question. Um, one of the issues is, is the availability of peripheral blood mononuclear cells from these patients. Um, Certainly, that there's an issue with us being able to do these studies with my colleagues in China during this outbreak. They weren't able to store a lot, so we're going to be able to see what we can do in the future. And again, in, in Canada and around the globe, where patient samples, uh, bloods are being collected, um, one would hope that those kinds of evaluations will be undertaken. So, to date, we don't know, um, but we'll wait and see. But the point is that we do know that this particular coronavirus, 
is very effective at suppressing an interferon response. Hence why I think it's valuable to come in uh, with interferon treatment. Right. Um, again, another uh, question um, more broadly. Are there any known polymorphisms of interferon signal pathway that affect the effectivity or severity of uh, individuals to, uh, to SARS-2? Uh, unknown. That, that, that's the honest truth. <laughs> we can make it broader to viral responses in general, I guess. The answer would be... Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think one of the points I wanted, you know, I think you, you'd appreciate from one of my early slides is that uh, interference have a very widespread um, influence on many different parameters. So um, in the context of polymorphisms, that hasn't, though, that, that's been studied, but there doesn't, it hasn't been widely studied in the context of a broad range of virus infections. So I don't know the answer to that. What I do know is that um, irrespective of the virus and irrespective of um, <coughs> the target, an interferon response uh, is such that you'll get a, a spectrum of interferon alpha subtypes that are induced as well as interferon beta dependent upon the virus. So it seems to be the virus that dictates the interferon response better than actually um, the individual patient. So we've taken bloods from healthy individuals and um, we've looked at that and I, I, don't, I don't know is, is the honest answer, but I, I suspect that there's not going to be a... We haven't identified individuals who have a null response to viruses. <coughs> Another interesting uh, question that, that relates to your study, were there any effects on interferon treatment on patients' ability to generate antibodies against the virus? Don't know. Haven't, uh, <laughs> you know, again, people are looking at that right now. Um, <laughs> once we do our RCT, we'll get, we're then going to have the opportunity to collect the bloods and do those kinds of measurements. I think you mentioned this, but uh, another question relates to, are there any uh, important comorbidities associated with treatment or lethalities associated with the treatment? Yeah, uh, so, so we certainly, we, so again, to reiterate, interferon did not invoke any adverse events, did not, uh, there certainly were no fatalities. This was a, a group that we considered to be moderately infected. They had no end organ dysfunction in any of them um, as a consequence of this infection. Um, we examined uh, amongst this cohort of 77, there were those who had hypertension, diabetes, they had comorbidities. There were uh, quite a, a range of ages and they were both males and females. So we examined each of those uh, variables uh, because we knew they influenced uh, disease outcome. And regardless of how we examined whichever statistical analysis, whether we considered, as I said, age as a continuous variable, or we looked at those less than 50 and those older than 50, um, although there were effects on um, the outcomes with interferon, it did not negate the effects. They still remained significant. So yes, each of those factors which we know contribute to disease severity um, have an impact. They did not negate the significance of the effects of interferon on viral clearance or on IL-6 and CRP reductions. Great. Another question regarding the, um, the use of this approach, uh, whether it would be um, able to induce uh, the reactivity or the uh, response in the elderly uh, affected by uh, the virus by interferon and also whether any uh, sex differences associated with the treatment and yeah, response so, to the virus as, I said, as well. And on to the second, second, second question, you know, they're, they're, uh, sex, so the point about sex is you have a number of variables with sex. You have pre, post, pub well, <coughs> post puberty, premenopausal, postmenopausal stage in the oestrocycus and cycle, whether the individuals are on contraceptives, whether they're pregnant or not. We didn't have anybody who was pregnant. So sex is a broad variable to consider. Gender is another issue. 
what we did is we only considered male versus female. And although there was an effect of sex on each of the parameters we measured, it, was not, it did not negate the effects of interferon treatment. Uh, same with comorbidities. I think that's the question that you asked. Um, you know, if people had hypertension, they tended to have a more severe disease, but it did not negate the effects on interferon treatment. And the same with age. Was that the question? Same with age. So, yeah, the question is whether it was safe for elderly. Uh, that's really, and what also well, we what had, diminishes we had the elderly response. Right. So again, we, we, they responded that answers that to question. interferon treatment. It was the same dose for everybody. They responded to interferon treatment, um, but uh, the response was not as robust in terms of rate of viral clearance as in those who are younger. All right. But again, this is a preliminary study, so I really don't want to make too much of our findings. I think we can make general conclusions, but I, I don't really don't want to pass it out to you. Okay, it's uh, being that it's 11 o'clock, uh, we're on the time, uh, my cuckoo clock tells me in my house. <laughs> I think we can um, uh, thank uh, uh, Dr. Fish for the uh, sharing her studies uh, and, and her insights into interferon uh, treatment uh, in this pandemic. And thank um, IUIS and Frontiers in Immunology for hosting uh, this uh, global talk on, on COVID-19. And everybody around the world, thank you for attending and your questions and um, look forward to the next uh, talk in this series. Everybody, uh, many thanks. Goodbye.